all the world virtually. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, before starting the session, let me introduce myself and Kiran's briefly. My name is Seon Hoo Park. I'm a pathologist and my major is gastrointestinal and radiation pathology. Since last August, I have newly taken the post of Director General of National Radiation Emergency Medical Center under the KIRAMS. The KIRAMS, the Korea Institute of Radiological and Medical Science, has been designated as the WHO co collaborating center in radiation emergency preparedness and response since 2017. Okay, uh, actually, I will share the first presentation for saving the time. Let me proceed to the first presentation right now. So our first speaker is Professor Hiroki Shimura. And Professor Shimura is the chairman of the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the Fukushima Medical University and the director of the Department of Thyroid Ultrasound Examination at the Radiation Medical Science Center. He is also a principal investor of the childhood thyroid cancer study that is being launched after Fukushima nuclear power plant accident in 2011. Now, he will present on the current progress and future challenges of thyroid ultrasound examination program in Fukushima. Then, Professor Shimura, the microphone is yours. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. I make a presentation on current progress and future challenges of thyroid ultrasound examination program in Fukushima. I'm Hiroki Shimura, working in the Radiation Medical Science Center and Department of Laboratory Medicine in Fukushima. <laughs> As you well know, we had a great East Japan earthquake just 10 years ago. Within one hour, a huge tsunami came to the east coast of Japan. Height of tsunami was more than 10 meters, and many towns near the Pacific Ocean totally destroyed, shown here. Uh, tsunami disabled the <coughs> electric power supply in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and induced melting through. Then radionuclide were leaked from reactors by hydrogen explosion. Leaking, leaking of radionuclide induced radioactive contamination mainly in the Fukushima prefecture, shown here. The panel on the right is the enlargement of the east, eastern part of Fukushima. Our university be located to around here. Just after nuclear accident, the screening of thyroid dose was conducted using survey meters for 1,080 children at an area near the nuclear power plant. As a result, a measured thyroid doses were all below 50 millisievert. In the unskilled analysis of thyroid dose after childbirth accident, the dose range below 50 millisievert is considered to be the lowest dose range, even the non evacuee in the Belarus. However, Japanese general public became particularly concerned with the possibility of childhood thyroid cancer similar to that observed following the nuclear Chernobyl accident. Therefore, thyroid ultrasound examination program, TUE program, began on October 9th, 2011. This is the flowchart of this, of this program. The TA program consists of primary examination and the secondary examination. Residents in Fukushima aged 18 years or younger at the extent were examined with a such portable 
ultrasound machine uh, as a primary examination every two years. After entering the generation over 20 years old, the examination will be performed every five years. This slide shows the diagnostic criteria of primary examination. When the examinee has a nodule more than five millimeter or cyst more than 20 millimeter, the result of the primary examination is judged category B or C and the secondary examination is recommended. In the secondary examination, we perform medical examination, ultrasonography with the high end apparatus and the blood and urine examination. For subject selected with a major management guideline for thyroid nodule, ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration cytology will be performed. This slide uh, shows the progress of TUE program. The primary examination of preliminary baseline survey, which is a first round survey, were conducted between 2011 to 13. Full scale survey was subsequently conducted every two years. In addition, survey conducted every five years or other generation. I've also studied in 2017. In the first round survey, more than 300,000 young residents participated and 0.8% of examining classified as B and one classified as C. In the first round survey, the 116 examines were diagnosed as malignant and uh, suspicious for malignancy. Mean age at the examination was 70.3 years. The mean tumor size was 13.9 millimeter. Most of the surgically treated cases were pathologically diagnosed as a papillary thyroid carcinoma. This slide shows the second round, the result of the second round. As shown in the here, 71 examining diagnosed as malignant were suspicious for malignancy. In order to clarify the relationship between the radiation dose and the detection of thyroid cancer, we analyzed the result of first and second su survey on several points of interest. Firstly, age distribution of cases diagnosed with malignant or suspicious was shown in this slide. As you can see, thyroid cancer were found in the elder ages. This is the second round result. In contrast to Fukushima uh, in Belarus after Chernobyl accident, more thyroid cancer found in the younger children. We then analyzed the odds ratio for thyroid cancer this detection according to the absorbed dose, uh, sorry, in the thyroid gland uh, estimated by unscale. This slide shows the adjusted odds ratio for detection of malignant or suspicious in the subject aged six to 14 years at the time of earthquake. Municipalities in Fukushima were classified into two, four groups by estimation, estimated thyroid dose. 
in the both, uh, both the first and second round, no dose dependent pattern emerges from the geographical distribution of absorbed dose. This slide shows uh, just a do, uh, odd ratio for detection of malignancy in subject aged 18, uh, sorry, 15 years or more at the time of the earthquake. In this generation, no dose dependent pattern, but also shown in the both rounds. Sorry, wait a moment. Uh, we also analyzed the gen genetic alteration in the thyroid cancer. This slide shows the tile plot of genomic alteration in 138 cases. The genomic pattern with a high prevalence of BRAF mutation and low frequency of chromosomal rearrangement, but completely different from post genomic papillary thyroid carcinoma. These results suggest that thyroid cancer found in the first and second round survey might not be associated with the radiation exposure. The third round survey finished uh, recently and the results are being analysis, but, re uh, but the result was considered to be similar to uh, before first and second round. In addition, the second, second examination of fourth round of survey is currently undergoing. So result is not uh, final uh, version. There are various opinions about our program, such as these typical opinions. Uh, thyroid cancer overdiagnosed in Fukushima, or a TUE program causing anxiety for the examinees and their families, isn't it? In recent years, especially in the South Korea and US and Euro European countries, dealing with the overdiagnosis of low risk thyroid cancer has become an issue, important issue. In Japan, we have pioneered the publication of guidelines that are able to manage the risk of overdiagnosis, but already applied them in the uh, clinical practice. In the secondary examination, we performed ultrasound guided FNAC only for subjects selected with a management guideline for thyroid nodule. This is the uh, uh, Japanese guideline of the thyroid nodule management. FNAC is recommended for nodules 5.1 to 10 millimeter in diameter with strongly, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, uh, strongly suspicious sonographic finding for malignancy. Nodule of 10 to 20 millimeter with any suspicious finding and all nodules over 20 millimeter. For decision making in the implementation of FNAC, I just, just some diagnosed criteria for thyroid nodule published in Japan was employed. This slide shows the FNAC implementation rate in the first and second round survey. In both rounds, FNAC implementation rate dependent on the nodule size. In addition to the ac uh, action in the secondary examination, effort exclude nodule below five millimeter from the secondary examination might contribute to the exclusion of latent cancer. 
in clinical practice, thyroid cancer management, including follow-up of thyroid cancer, is thought to contribute to reduction of over over treatment of low risk thyroid cancer. As a result of this effort, it has been shown that pro most proportion of low risk thyroid cancers, such as uh, T1A, M0, M0, among surgically treated thyroid cancer in the Fukushima, is extremely low. Finally, let me introduce our action for anxiety in participants in this program. Even before and after the primary examination, examinee and their families may have a question and or anxiety uh, shown here. To deal with these, we have opened the call center and medical hotline in addition, we have sent periodic newsletters to all examiners. We have opened a small booth with the medical doctors to explain intensive results just after examination. Uh, in the secondary confirmatory examination and sub subsequent surgical treatment, strong anxiety such as these may occur in the examines and families. To, to take measures against these, we have organized a thyroid support team consists of with clinical psychologists, medical social workers, nurses, and support examining consist, consistently throughout ex, examination, surgical treatment, and observation. This slide shows the typical support procedure in the second, secondary examination. At the time of first visit, they listen carefully to the examinee and family and help them relax. During the examination, uh, they accompany the examinee and family. The after examination, shown here, they check if uh, the examinee and family have any question and provide the necessary information. We believe that our effort to solve the issue in the TUE program will lead to the next challenge for our future. Thank you for your attention. These are acknowledgement. This photograph is a distant view of our university located in the nature of Fukushima. I hope everyone will be able to come to Fukushima in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shimura. And for your nice presentation, it is very impressive to us. And the next uh, session will be chaired by Dr. Ka for the second third presentation. And I will give the floor to Dr. Ka for the next sessions. Dr. Ka, please. Okay, Dr. Ka, you are on mute. Please press, please turn off on the microphone, please. My apologies, my apologies. Too, too much excitement to uh, introduce my good friend and, and co great colleague, um, Dr. Chun Sheng Li. Uh, Chun Sheng is a research scientist at the Radiation Protection Bureau uh, of Health Canada and an adjunct professor at the Carleton University. His research focuses on the monitoring, dosimetry, and medical management of internal radiation contamination. He is a chair of the Rampant Working Group on Internal Contamination Monitoring Assessment and Management, and one of the most active uh, Rampant members and supporters. 
Mr. Sheng, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Janat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the project team, uh, today I'm going to give, uh, give you a very quick summary of one project uh, we have just done uh, within the coordination of Rampan, which is the public health and, uh, 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 and medical management of internal contamination in past uh, incident. As all we know, uh, during uh, uh, instant or extinct, uh, people might get uh, internally contaminated with radionuclides. Managing uh, internal contamination, especially when many people are involved, it is challenging. It's not easy when we have uh, seen in the past extinct. Uh, experience gained and the lessons learned from the management of the past extinct or instant would inform the gaps for us to work on, to work to fill. Uh, in this project, we selected 13 instincts and we reviewed them uh, in 14 technical areas. These areas reflect uh, the requirement or recommendation of the international health regulations. Uh, as we don't have much time, I cannot go too much detail on the cases, uh, but we and each technical area, at least some samples, good ones or bad ones, uh, we will we'll go through them. The first group of instincts are large scale ones. Many of them, you know already, uh, they are well published, uh, but some of them are not. Uh, they occurred quite early, for example, the Castle Bravo, uh, instinct, uh, which involved a large nuclear detonation uh, that exposed uh, a big number of people in the Marshall Island. Uh, two others, the Techa River instinct and Custom uh, accident. We will learn more from uh, uh, the presentation of Dr. Akliev shortly on this. Uh, there are five smaller instincts, we call workplace uh, contamination instincts. Many of them uh, involve very small number of people or even only one, but this group of extents reveals specific technical uh, issue for us to address. Uh, for this group, there are two include, uh, two involved uh, owned contamination with plutonium isotopes and one uh, involved emergency Emergency 241 uh, in a, a lab space uh, explosion, and two from China. For technical areas, uh, the first one comes to uh, legislation, regulations, and emergency response plans. Uh, the regulations, legislations should be in place and enforced. Uh, we can see this from the Techa River uh, instance and Goiania. Uh, if we do have uh, regulations on the protection of public in the early 50s in the USSR, the release to the Techa River might, might be prevented, uh, similarly to, to the Goiania extinct. Uh, during the response to an instinct, Many organizations may be involved. Clear rules and authorities should be set. During the response to the London Project to 10 instance, the collaborations between different sectors were quite well. So the outcome, uh, the outcomes are very positive. This is very different for um, other instances, such as the Three Mile Island extinct. Uh, that happened a long time ago. When we make response plans, we should take uh, each and every practical considerations. For example, during the Fukushima response, uh, as the radiation background was elevated, uh, population monitoring could not proceed as fast as expected. 
The next uh, uh, technical area uh, is surveillance and the monitoring of the instinct. If we had a very robust instinct surveillance system and uh, the uh, and the mitigation mechanisms, we possibly could have avoided the Hanford uh, explosion uh, and the Kistim explosion. The next one is functioning monitoring program should be there. Uh, which we can use for early identification, uh, the Tesha River one and the, the uh, Chongqing uh, instance with the tritium, uh, they could be prevented at the very beginning. Monitoring at those assessment capability is important part of a preparedness. Uh, we all learned that screening uh, a, a large population is not easy. Uh, and uh, in, in the past accident, uh, at least a number of them, uh, we did need to screen a very, very large of population, even in vitro, in vivo, we need to do. And uh, we, 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 we suffered a, a, a quite a time over there. Uh, the other thing, over the years, we have been working very hard to develop capabilities, capacities, uh, in vivo, in vitro monitoring. Uh, and it appears that more work needs to be done in this area. Uh, and, uh, and more important, we need to develop such capacity. As to medical preparedness, uh, the response plan and the response capacity, when we develop this area, we need to bear many factors into considerations such as scarce resources and uh, crisis standard of care. We can learn a lot from a current COVID-19 pandemic. The availability and the implementation of medical countermeasures are important as we experienced in the response to the Hanford uh, instinct uh, and also the Goiania extinct. Uh, we need the, in, in that two uh, instincts, we, need, we needed a lot of uh, doses of uh, uh, decorporation agent, even for treating a small number of people. In case we have many people, we need to make sure the medical countermeasures are available over there. There are quite a number of uh, technical areas related to emergency response. Early identification of the instincts would, would be helpful. But uh, as you can see, at least a number of them, um, it was hard. If, if they could be identified earlier, the outcome would be very different. Uh, and next point is to uh, characterize the source term, uh, the exposure pathways and affect the population. If we can do this early, that'd be much better. Emergency risk communication is super important. I believe all of us agree on this. Um, as we are going to have an expert that talk about this part specifically, I will skip uh, but we learned a lot during the past, uh, managing the past uh, uh, stage. Evacuation and the sheltering. If we can be justified, we can save life. They are proving effective protective actions, not only for radiological nuclear emergencies, but also for other emergencies. But sometimes we, we need case specific justification, as we learned from the Fukushima accident. Administration of medical countermeasures. Uh, the good news for all these uh, incidents we reviewed in this project, we touched all 
all kind of medical containers from uh, uh, KI thyroid blocking to decompression to surface decontamination and to surgical removal of contaminated on the tissue on the tissues all covered in this reviewed uh, stage. Another one, food and drinking water restriction. If they can be implemented timely, the, the outcome will be uh, very positive. We can compare the response to Fukushima and the response to Chernobyl. We will see that you know, in the first case, uh, 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 the significant intake of radium nuclides was avoided. We have touched uh, population monitoring in the propelling space uh, in that, that technical area. Um, I want to, I'm not going to talk too much here, but I want to suggest that we do need to improve throughput. That is, in a short period of time, how to manage a large population as each activity from monitoring to decontamination to those assessment, each activity takes time. And when we, when we need to manage many people, how to handle them, this is a very important part. Relocation, uh, temporary or sometimes not necessarily temporary uh, is necessary, but this is subject to national regulations and the case specific justification. I put all three uh, long term activities on this slide. They are important technical areas for recovery process. Uh, you know, in the first uh, uh, presentation today, uh, we, 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 we learned that during Fukushima. This, they have set a very good uh, health merit survey program. Uh, what I want to see here, uh, each activity is, is, is very, very demanding, is time demanding and resource demanding. Uh, we need to design very carefully and justify very carefully. This is the last slide I have summarizing the gaps uh, for us to fill. Screening. With the current uh, social media uh, availability and a new IT technology, uh, information spread very fast. After the emergency, many people might want to be screened. We are possibly going to experience flood of information, uh, flood population in a short period of time. So how to increase screening capability is very important. I think we need new strategies and uh, using emerging technologies. We have to uh, think out of the current box for monitoring and dose assessment. Uh, as I mentioned just now, very important is the search capacity. We might need to think, not only develop individual uh, capabilities or capacity for individual labs, but also to develop a national and international lab networks. For medical quantum measure, we need to develop evidence-based practical guidelines. For example, for uh, decorporation of System one said they will use portion below. Do we really need the current prescribed one gram per day and the three three doses, a three one gram per dose and three doses per day? Stockpiles. We need to develop stockpiles, but also we need to develop sharing mechanisms. If we can share medical containers, that be good. Uh, and in addition, we might need to do more research to improve the current use 
the, the use of currently available drugs. And above all, sustainable capacity is important. We develop all the capabilities and capacity. We need to make sure they are sustainable as we don't know when emergency is going to happen. With that, I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chunxin. Um, very interesting presentation. Actually, it was a good overview of the project which we started together. And Chunsheng sent me the review paper, some 60 pages to review some time ago, and I didn't have time to look at it yet. So this is a nice summary of that paper. I appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alexander Akleev. Uh, Dr. Akleev is a radiobiologist and a medical doctor. He is the director of the Urals Research Center for Radiation Medicine in Chelyabinsk, Russia, Russian Federation, and the head of the Department of Radiobiology at the Chelyabinsk State University. Since 1996, Professor Akleev has been the head of the WHO Collaborating Center uh, for uh, radiation research and radiation emergency medical preparedness and response. Uh, his major research interests include health effects of chronic radiation exposure and radiation effects at low doses. Alexander, the floor is yours. Can you unmute yourself, please? Because we don't hear you. I am sorry. We had your presentation a moment before. Now I don't see it anymore. Are you sharing it or are you are starting over? Maybe you can try to stop sharing and start again. Yeah, now I see it, yes. Maybe you can go to full screen mode. So the right bottom corner of your screen. Do you listen? Do you hear me? Yes, finally. Yes, perfect. Yes. Go ahead. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing yes. me? Yes. I'm, I am sorry. No problem. Uh, my presentation is devoted to the comparative analysis of health effects of two radiation accidents that took place in 1950s in the Urals region of Russia. These are the releases of radioactive waste into the Techa River and explosion of the storage tank of liquid radioactive waste in 1957. The latter is better known as a Kishtim accident. And both accidents happened at the Mayak Production Association and were caused by absence of reliable technologies of processing and storage of radioactive waste. Accidental and routine releases into the Techa River occurred from 1949 through 1956. As seen from the figure, these releases differed in activity and isotopic composition. It is important to note that maximum accident accidental releases were registered in 1951. For instance, as a result of releases in October, more than 60% of total radioactivity of long-lived radionuclides entered the river. During this period, maximum values of exposition dose rate were registered in the river floodplain and riverside settlement. 1957 accident was caused by the thermochemical explosion of the storage tank of the liquid radioactive waste, radionuclide, 
fallout occurred 11 hours following the explosion. Thanks to uniform northeast wind direction, radioactively contaminated territory was a rather narrow strip of land. It was named East Urals Radioactive Trace, EUIT. It should be mentioned that the formation of EUIT was caused by only 10% of the released activity. The major part of the activity fell out in the territory near the explosion site. As it can be seen from the table, both of the accidents were comparable in activity that led to the contamination of the territory where the population resided. In the first years after the accidents, both Techa and EUIT residents were affected by external gamma and internal exposure, mainly due to short-lived radionuclides. Later, high content of strontium-90 in the discharges contributed to high dose exposure to the red bone marrow of both populations. It should be noted that no emergency measures were implemented after the contamination of the Techa River. Scheduled activities included a relocation about 10,000 people to exclude the use of the river and contaminated areas by the population that remained to live on the river, a sanitary protection zone was established. Contaminated floodplain of the river was withdrawn from land use. Water supply systems and wells were constructed for the population. It can be seen from the figure that with the help of the dams, the Techa River was isolated from the contaminated reservoirs where the radioactive waste were dumped in turn. Major protective measures following 1957 accidents are given in the slide. Emergency measures included evacuation of more than 1,000 people from nearby villages. About 10,000 residents of the EUIT were resettled later. Planned activities also included the establishment of a sanitary protection zone, the contamination of settlements and agricultural land was carried out. Radiation monitoring made it possible to control the contamination of food. The enlargement of farms has greatly facilitated radiation monitoring of agricultural products. The production of grain and vegetables was banned and the production of milk was limited. You can see that Techa River and EUIT cohorts were comparable in size and follow-up period. They included people of different ages with a large proportion of children and women. As it, as it has already been mentioned, nature of the exposure of both cohort members was similar. It was long-term exposure due to external and internal radiation. High doses to red bone marrow were caused mainly by strontium-90. To assess the content of strontium-90 in the cohort members, large-scale measurements were carried out. They included more than 32,000 in vivo measurements on a whole body counter and more than 3,000 radiochemical measurements of strontium-90 in the bones of the deceased. The content of strontium-90 in the residents of the Techa River site villages was approximately two orders of magnitude higher than that of the residents of EUIT. Individualized organ doses indicate a significant excess of the absorbed dose to red bone marrow as compared to the stomach dose to the Techa River cohort members. In the EUIT cohort, the absorbed doses to red bone marrow were significantly lower than those in the Techa River cohort, while the doses to the stomach were comparable. The analysis of the collective effective dose 
indicated a significantly greater damage to the health of the members of the Techa River cohort than that to the EUIT. The effectiveness of countermeasures measures strongly depended on the timing of the implementation. Resettlement early after the accident was one of the most effective countermeasures. It can be seen that resettlement of people from EUIT during the first 10 days after the accident resulted in the maximum averted doses. It significantly reduced the doses from external gamma exposure and terminated the dietary intake of short-lived radionuclides. The resettlement of residents at a later date after the accident was not sufficiently justified. Deterministic effects were most clearly revealed among residents of the Techa Riverside villages. They had cases of chronic radiation syndrome and tissue reactions, mainly suppression of hematopoiesis and immunity, neurological disorders. Moderate decrease in the number of neutrophils, lymphocytes, and thrombocytes in the peripheral blood was more often registered in EUIT residents in the first year after the accident. They had no clinical manifestations. Incidence and mortality of solid cancer and leukemia were used as a criteria for long-term health effects. It can be seen that in both cohort, both linear and quadratic models equally describe the dependence of the excess relative risk of cancer mortality on the dose. It can be seen that there is no evidence of a threshold effect. Large uncertainty in the excess relative risk estimates remains at low doses of 100 milligray or less. Over the entire follow-up period, more than 2,300 deaths from malignant tumors, including 50 cases that could be attributed to radiation were registered in Techa River cohort. In the EUIT cohort, there were 1,039 and 26 cases respectively. The attributive risk had similar values Excess relative risk of death from cancer per unit dose was significantly increased in both cohorts and its value was the same. Analysis of cancer incidence showed a significant increase in excess relative risk in the Techa River cohort. Cancer risk in the EUIT cohort was lower and statistically insignificant. In the analysis of the incidence of leukemia, excluding chronic lymphatic leukemia, attention is drawn to the high attributive risk of radiation-induced leukemia in Techa River cohort. Of 72 cases of leukemia, 34 are due to radiation exposure. Using a linear model, a statistically significant increase in the excess relative risk of leukemia was recorded only in Techa River cohort. Thus, the protective measures taken following the 1957 accident, or so-called Kishtim accident, turned out to be much more effective and may it possible to significantly minimize the health consequences for the EUIT population. The EUIT residents showed a significantly lower body burden of strontium-90 and lower doses to red bone marrow due to internal exposure. Lower collective effective doses rate and uh, deterministic and carcinogenic effects confirm the effectiveness of countermeasures after the 1957 accident. Emergency countermeasures such as evacuation of people were of the greatest importance for ensuring the safety of the EUIT population. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Very good presentation. 
Next speaker presented will be by Dr. Park. Okay, I will uh, introduce the first presentation, a first speaker, the Janeka and the, our sessions chair. The Dr. Janeka is a radiation oncologist by training with a degree in radiation biology and postdoctoral training in radiation epidemiology. Since 2002, she has been in charge of the radiation emergency preparedness and response activities of the World Health Organization. Dr. Carl leads two global expert network of WHO, the Rampan Network and the BioDose Net Network. In addition, she holds a master's degree in radiation biology, PhD in radiotherapy with a postdoctoral training in radiation epidemiology. She is the author and the co-author of more than 30 peer-reviewed publications. Today, he will present the WHO framework for management of mental health and psychosocial impact of radiation emergency. And after the presentation, Dr. Ka will uh, lead the last uh, final presentation. Then, Dr. Ka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Park. It is my great pleasure to present our very recent publication uh, entitled Framework for Management of Mental Health and Psychosocial Consequences of Radiation Emergency. Um, as we already heard from previous uh, presentations, and it is a very well-established fact that uh, any emergencies always have a significant impact on mental health and well-being of people. Um, it is reported that um, uh, the prevalence of common mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety can double or more in crisis situations. One person in five affected, for example, by a, a conflict or disa natural disaster is estimated to have depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other conditions. We also know that despite their tragic nature and adverse effects of mental health, emergencies have shown to be an opportunity to build and improve existing systems, especially mental health systems for all people in need. We know that psychosocial impact uh, was reported to be largest uh, and outweighed actually uh, direct ideological consequences of uh, nuclear accidents, as we've seen from the examples of Chernobyl and also Fukushima accidents. Um, social stigma may affect relocated people, uh, discrimination and uh, even bullying at school were reported. It may also explain a low response sometimes to the invitations to follow up uh, a medical screening, which in itself also is a stressful procedure and adds uh, an additional stress to children and to their parents. Um, WHO has been uh, for a number of years uh, chairing the uh, Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergency Settings. This group has developed a number of uh, benchmark uh, guidelines and tools to manage this type of impact in uh, any emergencies. Um, so these are existing norms and standards which are applied in a different type of emergencies, but we have not yet brought it to be used in uh, management and preparedness for nuclear and radiological emergencies. In uh, radiological nuclear emergencies area, we have a very well developed set of uh, normative uh, guidance and uh, safety guides and procedures, protocols, um, which heavily are based on uh, some metrics on uh, dosimetry, on those concepts, on uh, um, measured quantities of exposure rates, etc. And as I said, we also have a, a very well developed uh, system of international guides and normative and policy advice uh, publications for managing mental health in generic emergencies and disasters. The problem is that these two fields are not yet integrated. And uh, the question is how to bring these two together, how to make two sectors to interact and to come up with joint solutions. So while discussing this issue, WHO has been actually actively advocating for that and creating a momentum 
through publications in scientific journals, through discussions with expert community uh, and specialists in various international fora. Here you see the list of different events where WHO has been presenting its um, views and advocating for the need to move forward in addressing the non-radiological health impact of uh, nuclear accidents. Um, this uh, work has actually um, uh, made a major leap forward through um, the uh, cooperation with the Nuclear Energy Agency of OECD in Paris in France. Uh, we jointly launched a two-phase project back in 2008 uh, as a first phase of this project, WHO uh, was to develop uh, a policy framework document using existing WHO documents and guidelines for managing mental health in generic emergencies. And as a phase two, uh, NEA working group uh, dealing with um, uh, nuclear emergency, working party for nuclear emergency matters, WPNM, uh, would lead the task for uh, developing derivative products based on the WTO framework, uh, tools, guides, checklists, etc., to uh, support emergency planners and responders um, to provide them the tools for efficient mitigation of psychosocial impact. So within a um, couple of years, this work advanced and you can see some timeline and major uh, milestones uh, which actually uh, culminated in uh, uh, publishing the um, document at the end of last year. And we held a webinar launch on 27 November. And we have um, the recording of the webinar uh, available on YouTube channel. The structure of the document is as follows. There is an introduction followed by the uh, overall description of what are the mental and psychosocial consequences of uh, radiation emergencies. Then we looked into the issues which are cross-cutting through the entire emergency cycle, through um, planning and uh, responding and uh, mitigating consequences and recovery. Um, then we looked at uh, how these uh, MHPSS aspects are integrated in uh, different phases of emergency cycle. And um, uh, at the end, we discussed challenges of its implementation, and looked into research needs and um, finished by the glossary and references. What I wanted to point out this uh, uh, very interesting principle of five C's, we call them five C's. These are cross-cutting considerations, uh, as I mentioned, which go apply through entire emergency cycle. Coordination, communication, community engagement, capacity building, and applying core ethical values to uh, mental health and psychosocial support uh, systems in preparedness and response and in emergencies. Um, the existing um, policies and uh, normative documents in uh, the field of mental health uh, impact management very often use this uh, intervention pyramid. As you can see that this pyramid starts from a very low cost and uh, um, type of interventions such as self-care, for example, or people being informed and getting information from some common sources. And these are the largest uh, proportion of affected people will be using this type of intervention. And this, is, this has a lowest cost. Further on, uh, there are more targeted types of interventions which will be applicable to uh, less um, proportion of a small proportion of population, such as uh, community care, further primary health care services by uh, trained uh, professionals. And uh, the pyramid ends up with a very small part of a population which will actually need um, uh, formal clinical uh, management of uh, their mental health. And of course, that is, has the highest cost and, and the smallest proportion of people will need this type of intervention. Key messages of the framework are, uh, we said that the radiation emergencies have unique mental health impacts. Uh, the document elaborates on these uh, unique features, mental health and psychosocial consequences such as fear, anxiety, emotional and behavioral changes may outweigh the direct impact of radiation exposure. 
A public health approach uh, with an emphasis on MHPSS interventions is essential for planning and responding effectively to radiation emergencies and must include interdisciplinary capacity building activities to ensure that MHPSS is integrated within existing arrangements for response. Uh, Cross-sector coordination uh, between radiation protection and MHPSS actors Community engagement, risk communication, and applying core ethics, ethics principles are crucial for uh, strengthening preparedness and for efficient response to radiation emergencies. We need practical tools to be developed uh, based on the framework in order to promote the integration of the MHPSS within existing arrangements uh, and to support the emergency response. And uh, research is a very important component. It is needed to further understand the mental health vulnerability to radiation emergencies, to explore the best tools, and to strengthen the evidence base for, uh, to, for appropriate image basis action. And this is the final slide of my uh, presentation. As I mentioned, um, we are taking questions through the chat section. So those who are connected, please don't hesitate. Um, type your questions here in the chat uh, window. Uh, also, our uh, website for those who are registered uh, participants, uh, there is also a special uh, place in ERPA Congress website for putting, uh, typing your questions there. We're also monitoring that page. Um, now taking, putting back the hat of a, uh, co-chair of the session. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, this is Mr. Patrick Meshen Moser, who is the founder of Meshen Moser Situation Management Consultancy Company, specialized in risk and crisis communication and informed decision-making and exercises. Patrick has some 15 years of experience with international crisis and risk communication. He is a member of the EPR and Radiation Risk Committees of the German Commission of Radiological Protection. And also he is a former crisis communication advisor at the uh, Incident and Emergency Center of IAEU. His impressive portfolio includes working as a spokesperson for one of the world's largest airlines and also a media relations director at one of the largest pharmaceutical companies. Patrick holds a master's degree in international relations and history. Uh, and he is giving uh, a different format talk today. It will be uh, delivered in the format of TED Talk. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And also thank you very much, uh, Madam Co-Chair, for uh, inviting me today to uh, talk about uh, infodemics and give you a very brief introduction, give a very brief overview of what infodemics are, um, a, a word that basically the WHO coined a couple of years ago during the first SARS uh, uh, pandemic and now of course during the COVID uh, pandemic is very, very, very uh, important uh, topic. Um, I want to take you a little bit back a couple of months on the evening of November 2nd, 2020, uh, the first time that I heard about a uh, terrorist attack is unfolding in the inner city of Vienna was through a message a friend sent me via a messenger app, Telegram. That's a messenger app like WhatsApp, for example, or WeChat. And then I immediately turned to uh, my social media channels, Twitter and so on. And I already, already saw hundreds of messages uh, and, and people that were talking about this attack. During the course of the night in the next hours that all started around 9 p.m. in the evening local time, there were hundreds and hundreds of messages, tweets, Instagram, you name it, about uh, potential hostage situations at different locations all over the city. There were um, reports about numerous attackers that are still at large in the city. At the end, there were hundreds of videos of pictures shared of the potential terrorists 
and so on. At the end, it turned out that only nine minutes after the first shots fired, the terrorist was taken down by local police forces and killed. So after nine minutes, the terrorist attack was over and still it was unfolding on social media for hours and hours, causing a lot of uncertainty, causing a lot of confusion and making uh, the tactical response of the police forces very, very hard because every misinformation, every speculation of a hostage situation, every picture that might show a terrorist, they had to take it into account, they had to screen and look at. So it was a very, very confusing situation. And in such situations, people do sometimes very, very dangerous things like approximately four years ago, a similar case in, in Munich, already after the the attacker was killed by the police for hours. There were people jumping through closed windows in restaurants in Munich because they heard suspicious noises and thought there might be still terrorists because on social media, there was speculation about terrorists still at large in the city and still uh, attacking the people. So this is what we talk about when we talk about infodemics. In this case, it's more epidemic infodemic, so very local one. But nevertheless, but nevertheless, it is an infodemic, and the WHO puts it quite well uh, when it when it says it's an overwhelming overabundance of information, both true information and false information. But it's very hard in this uh, information overload for the people to tell the good news from the bad news and to, to see what is, what is the case, what is going on. Um, Daniel Kahneman, I think you all know him, he differentiates our thinking in two systems. On the one side, we have the fast system. This is the system that is more unconsciously taking place. Like when we drive our car, or in my case, my motorbike, and we don't have to think so much about it. Uh, and on the other hand side, there is the slow system, the system that processes things, that when we get more details, more information, we think about things and we try to figure out what this is. And for example, if uh, you drive a car and I sit next to you and all of a sudden I tell you, hey, what is, what is uh, 300,046 multiplied with 472? then all of a sudden both things get different, difficult for you, both driving and calculating because your, your brain is a little bit jammed and a little bit overwhelmed and you need to, to focus on these detailed um, uh, figures that I gave you. So this is the problem when we talk about information overload during an infodemic. And how is this information overload created? It's not only by the sheer volume of information. This is already a problem. But it's also by mis- and disinformation that gets spread. In case of, for example, the terrorist attack, so many hostage situations that allegedly were taking place, none of them were true. But you need to figure out, am I in danger? Are my loved ones in danger? And you're stuck in that information overload and try to make the right decision. And it gets more and more difficult. Also conflicting information. I think we all know this uh, during the emergency when a lot of authorities are involved uh, and a lot of authorities are communicating, there is conflicting information. And this is a problem where people, um, uh, that, that people have in this case. So information overload is a complex thing. And it creates the TMI effect. And believe it or not, in this case, it doesn't mean Three Mile Island. Uh, it is a different effect. If we look at the relation between uncertainty and information, the volume of information, amount of information, and the grade of detail, then it is clear that on the beginning, when there is not much information and the people want to find out what is going on, this is a danger zone for fake news. Because if we do not provide them with information during the emergency, they turn to other sources and they might uh, take advantage of that. So we all know we need to communicate fast and thoroughly. And I will not repeat all these, um, these uh, principles of good risk communication because I think there were talks before and you all heard that already. But 
this is something that we need to, to look at. And so unfortunately, this is not a linear development. You could think, okay, you, the more information I give the, give the people, the less they are uncertain about what's going on. That's not true. In fact, it's a bell curve. It's an inverted bell curve. And that is the big problem because there is an ideal point where we give, give them enough information with enough detail so they can make good choices and good decisions and where they can switch from or where the slow system is, is able to compute all this information. But when we give them in too much information or too much detail, then all of a sudden the uncertainty rises again because they cannot compute it. They don't, cannot find out what is right and what is wrong. So we need to be careful not to overwhelm the people with too much detail, with too much uh, conflicting information or with just the sheer volume of information. Okay, and um, now we are of course in a situation with COVID-19 that's a completely different ball game. I will not repeat everything. We all are in this together for a year now. We know what COVID-19 is, uh, the dangers, the discussions and so on. But what we need to be aware of, look at these figures here. And I took deliberately a week from June, 2020 because all my my data is uh, uh, from mid last year because there's already some research out there. It's not too much, but there's some research out there. Look at this. In one week, 26 million mentions of uh, COVID on social media. In one week, 26 million and 2.7 million on, sorry, that should uh, read traditional media, of course, traditional news media. And this morning I Googled COVID and I got more than 6 billion hits, 6 billion hits on COVID. Just as a comparison, if you Google Islam, it's about 1 billion uh, hits. And uh, also uh, if you Google the moon, who is around a little bit longer than COVID and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, then it's a third of what we have in hits of, uh, for, for COVID. And how does that happen? How is this working? And look at this graph. It only goes to 2018 because that's the best data I got. Just kind of uh, extend these lines to the sky and then you have the situation today. We have today more than 5 billion people in the world that are somehow engaged on social media. That's a penetration of way over half of the world's population that are active on social media. Now think about, are you active on social media? Yes or not? If not, imagine how many people there are uh, and uh, how they use it. And if you say yes, but we had this problem also during the Fukushima Daiichi accident, where there were a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation on social media. True, absolutely true. But look at this. This was 2011. Since then, the use of social media more than quadrupled and there are so many people out there. Also look at this, WhatsApp is probably now here somewhere. WhatsApp kind of uh, messenger app that I just mentioned like Telegram or WeChat. These are the black boxes. We don't even know what the people talk about there because we cannot search these channels. There's a lot of place for rumor. And also look at this, TikTok, TikTok here, which is a, which is a video app for, for the youngsters is way bigger than Twitter now. So, in the, uh, in the age group between 14 and 24, way more people are on TikTok than are on Twitter. So think about your authorities and your organization. You have a Twitter account maybe, you have a Facebook account, but you need to be very careful not to leave the youngsters behind because they are not on Facebook anymore and they're for sure not on Twitter. Also look at this. We, we can see here the blue line is the relative search volume on Google about COVID and the red lines are actual reported cases of COVID. Look at this. The search volume is actually in most countries, in most countries, a predictor for coming cases that are reported. How can that be? It's because, well, you have one case in your, in your, um, in your vicinity, in your family, among your friends, and then you start to Google. And if you have five friends, five friends start to Google. So with every reported case, you have five people that start searching on the internet. 
So we can use this data also. We can use this as a predictor to see how will a pandemic really develop. Plus, if we do not manage to close that gap between when the people look for it, approximately 11 uh, days before the peak of the reported cases, and when, when it really happens, then they will look for different sources of information and that will probably not the best ones. That will probably also, it's also a delta where the fake news will be able to, to come in. And when we talk about mis and disinformation, uh, it's, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not a, a, a rocket science to know that the miracle cures are probably way up because especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when we cannot tell the people, yes, there's a cure, when there's no vaccine, and we have to tell them, you know, you can just protect yourself. Of course, people look for, hey, is there something else? Is there some, some cure, some, some ginger juice that I can drink that is anti antiviral, like many influencers on, on, on Instagram claimed to sell their stuff? So that is a dangerous, a dangerous thing. Also think about these kind of things. This is a clickbait um, uh, disinformation or misinformation. It, is, it was made up. Of course, the Pope was never infected, but these guys, they deliberately put up a single web page to promote this fake news to get traffic on their website to gain revenues from, from advertising. And this is how this uh, fake news was spread for a couple of days that the Pope is infected with, uh, uh, with COVID. So there are more, more dangerous uh, uh, fake news, of course, but this is something that was very, very viral in the first days of the, the pandemic. Also think about conflicting information, something we often contribute to. You remember when the WHO, but also the German Robert Koch Institute and also the CDC say you don't have to wear any masks. It's, it's basically almost more dangerous to wear masks. And then all of a sudden, people, uh, the, the same expert said, now I think now it's good to wear masks. It's because in Europe, for example, we had no culture of wearing masks, contrary to Asia, for example. And also they were afraid that they would not have enough masks for the medical staff. So they just said, no, no, you don't need that. That backfired. Because when they later said, now you should wear masks, the people had lost the trust. And also look at this. We also talk about international pandemic. This is what, what makes this infodemic a pandemic one. It's all around the globe. And so we have dashboards information from all over the world about, for example, Germany. The funny thing is, and I took this screenshot yesterday between 2049 and 2051, all these three uh, figures are different. And they are different because the time when they are um, taken are diff is different and when they're reported is different, but also the way they get the information is different. Now this makes not much difference anymore now that we are one year in the pandemic. But at the beginning, when we were talking about way less cases, a, a couple of percent of difference made a lot of, uh, uh, of difference for the people when it comes to trust. So they said, listen, there are th three different numbers. Which number can we trust? The people don't know anything. And at the end, you might ask yourself, yeah, but that is COVID. What about nuclear emergencies? Well, the problem is that COVID and this pandemic that we see, there are a lot of similarities, actually. The risk perception factors are, are the same. The complexity of the national response is the same. And also the public interest is the same. So we need to look at this um, at this pandemic. And at the end, we need to ask ourselves questions. Um, for example, the topical and methodolog met methodological ones about risk communication. WHO had done a great job, put out a lot of uh, great um, uh, uh, material and a lot of great advice. Also, I have to applaud them for being actually on all the relevant uh, uh, social media channels, also for the youngsters, also on TikTok, also on Instagram, very well done. But we cannot focus uh, anymore only on this. We also need to ask societal questions. What kind of information do we want that the people get and how do they want to get it? What is the quality of the, uh, uh, the information? Do we have to regulate social media somehow? We need to ask these questions. And last but not least, the individual questions. We also need kind of hygienic uh, rules like washing the hands or sneezing in the elbow for information. We need to treat, uh, we need to teach the people that they need to be hygienic when it comes to information, 
to look at the source, to look at the content, to do cross checks, to do fact checking, this kind of hygienic um, uh, actions that can preserve them for getting infected by fake news. And that's it from my point here from Vienna and I give back to the chairs and thank you very much for hanging. Thank you, Patrick. As usual, it's such a pleasure to see you performing. Excellent, excellent quality. Very interesting presentation. Thank so Rampan should get a TikTok channel. Huh? Who is going to take care of that? <laughs> we will ask our younger colleagues, maybe somebody would be interested to run a TikTok channel for Rampan. Also interesting um, diagrams showing um, the um, increase of searches media in social media on internet just a few days before actually the incidence raises uh, you showed many countries that for several countries but Egypt didn't have that peak interesting so what happens in Egypt <laughs> well so I'm looking at the chat and I don't see any questions um, I can also ask if any of uh, speakers have questions to uh, other speakers, since our audience seems to be silent. I look at the ERPA website also, don't see any questions, which is not surprising. Actually, it's not clear to me how to submit a question on the website. It just shows up as an empty page. I don't see any window where to type a question. Excuse me, Dr. Jare. Yes, Does Dr. Shimura have a question to, yes. to somebody. Okay. Dr. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask Patrick, uh, the resident in Fukushima are still afraid of rumors from people in uh, from other areas in the social media. The Fukushima died nuclear power plant uh, stored huge amount of contaminated water with a very low dose of tritium. Uh, but uh, it cannot be disposed due to uh, fear of uh, bad rumors. Uh, still now, no good way to deal with the rumors has been obtained and uh, even after 10 years, it is still in... I would like to appreciate uh, any advice from uh, Patrick for uh, <laughs> but, very, uh, but rumor in the social media or some, uh, some, some news media. I would like to ask Patrick. Thank you, Hiroki-san, for your question. Um, Yes, I've been I've been to Fukushima a couple of years ago and I was standing about the, in front of the unit three and four and I, I, I could see what what's going on there and can imagine that there are still some rumors out there. Also, for example, in Germany, there were a lot of rumors about hotspots and how dangerous it is for visitors of the Olympic Games, for example, a lot of hilarious rumors. Um, the, the bitter truth is that we will never be able to fight all these rumors. And I think we need to live a little bit with misinformation and disinformation. Mm. We see in the COVID-19 crisis, for example, in Germany, that there will always be a kind of 15 to 16 percent portion of the population. They just don't want to be convinced. And, and if, we, if we put too much effort on convincing them that don't want to be convinced because they are conspiracy theorists or whatever, we, we lose the ones that are undecided. So I'm afraid there is no miracle recipe. Everything that the WHO says, that the IEA says, that is right. We need to be available. We need to be, we need to be um, active in our communication. There's just one thing I would really advocate is we need to uh, go far away and I, I think you all, you really know that. I don't have you tell you that, but mm -hmm. from, from too many figures, from too many units, uh, reproduction rate R, for example, is already something that is hard to compute. Um, and I think we also need to make sure that when we talk about risk, for example, we do not put the relative risk, like it's 30% more likely or whatever. We also always need to, to take the natural relations, like one person out of 10,000 might suffer from from uh, from cancer things like that 
that will not be uh, the miracle solution, of course, but uh, we need to kind of always, always, always repeat this. And there's one thing that I would advocate as well. Don't patronize the people. Don't try to persuade them to do what you want them to do. This is something you need to do during the, the emergency response. Tell them, leave the house now or stay in the house. But before and after an emergency, try to convince them. And I know in Japan, they, you're taking a lot of effort to do that and have ex excellent uh, um, approaches, actually. Thank you very much. That's a very good comment. Actually, uh, what I hear uh, Patrick saying also that we need to build trust in the community. Prior to the accident, we need to establish a good communication channels, interact with the people residing around the facilities. And as we see from uh, the historic experiences, from what was reported, uh, this is very important. And building trust is one of the uh, major bricks in the basis of uh, uh, proper risk communication strategy development and using it in crisis communication. Anybody else has other questions? Chongsheng, unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. I have a, a quick question for Dr. Samurai regarding the Fukushima Health Medical. Sorry. Uh, so you, you talked about uh, the sorrow the screening. Uh, and there are also some publications already on that. Besides the thyroid part, what uh, other observations we have so far? Do we have any other? Okay. We are conducting a, a survey for radiation dose and a survey for pregnant women and a survey for a blood count, blood cell count, and psychosocial. Uh, impact. So, so far we have no um, evidence, no effect, radiation effect on the pregnant woman and uh, for example, blood cell count. But uh, we have a very big impact on the psychological issues. So, especially in the uh, area, evacuation area, people in the evacuation area, they have to uh, move to the other um, area and they, they lose uh, community, local community. So they have often uh, have a depression and something like that. So we are going to support uh, the, them and con we are continue to uh, interviews, uh, interview with the evacuated people, uh, as well as the uh, 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 living people in Fukushima. So I, I think the uh, biggest uh, problem in the Fukushima is the psychological issue. And in, the, in our thyroid, prob uh, thyroid uh, program, uh, we, are go we are going to uh, take care of the psychological uh, problem with a um, uh, people afraid of the thyroid cancer risk. So it's a very big problem in the psychological. <laughs> Other <laughs> is not so much. Okay. <laughs> well, fortunately, in Fukushima, you have a very good expert, Professor Mataharu Maeda contributed, mm. yeah. made a major contribution to the development mm. of the framework yeah. we published. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, some member of uh, Professor Maeda uh, cooperate with the uh, thyroid program, so they are supporting the psychological uh, mm. program with the thyroid nodule. Okay, I want also to ask a question uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Um, Professor Akliev. Um, in your presentation, uh, you compare two accidents, which are actually 
have so many similarities, but also the scenario itself was quite different, right? The explosion of 1957 was uh, acute, let's say, uh, a big release in, in the short term of time, uh, versus the uh, Techa River was over the years in, in a slow explosion, let's say. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. Uh, I have not followed closely your uh, recent publications, so I do not recall if this is the new approach. Now you are comparing them in terms of in the context of emergency um, protective actions which were put in place. So this is a new approach, or you have already published something with this regard? Uh, thank you, Janat, for your question. It's a new approach. Uh, we used it for for the first time. Uh, in reality, the scenario is uh, very different for, for the Techa River and for the uh, Kishtim explosion. You are right. The different pathways uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the radionuclides, uh, I mean the internal uh, pathways to the humans. But in, in principle, uh, in both situations, we have uh, the uh, some chronic exposure, prolonged exposure, because uh, the residents of the nearest uh, villages in Kishtim accident were relocated uh, at first 10 days. And the, another population was relocated uh, later, but uh, uh, the main proportion of the EUAT people also were exposed to chronic exposure for many years. Um, mainly by um, uh, strontium 90, but the um, uh, content of strontium in EUIT population, as I, I said, was rather lower than in Techa River cohort, mainly as a result of uh, more effective protective measures uh, for this population, because uh, the specialists uh, in uh, 1950s uh, in situation in Techa River, they hadn't any experience about the countermeasures. They, uh, they did some uh, counter, planned countermeasures, but they mainly have delayed in time. And in volume, they, uh, what not, they, was, they were not enough. For, uh, they not involve all the population who are living in the riverside uh, uh, settlements. Uh, from this point of view, it, it was a first um, attempt to analyze, to, to do the comparative an analyze of the health effects. And also uh, for the first time, we estimate the collective effective dose as a detriment uh, for the health. Uh, it's not the, the dosimetric uh, units, it's uh, uh, units for the analysis of health harm as a result of a radiation accident. It, it also show the uh, less effectiveness of Techa River uh, countermeasures than it was made in EUIT. Well, luckily, in the recent years since Chernobyl accident, the system of uh, emergency response has evolved and uh, developed. So we're lucky to have a uh, very different world today. So I hope we will not have an, any major accidents anytime soon. But uh, what we are living now through the COVID pandemic is uh, already sufficient. Uh, the other day I watched a new film on Amazon Prime called The Songbird. I don't know if you heard of that. Patrick maybe would be interested. It's talking about COVID-23 pandemic in the world within near future. All right, so who else has any comments and questions? I just want to say that the Chernobyl documentary was already enough for me. Oh, yes, yes, that was very um, <laughs> unfortunate, the way it was portrayed. 
despite the good cinematograph, their cinematography, the good work and excellent work of actors and uh, incredible uh, uh, recreation of the ambience of uh, 80s in terms of uh, decorations and uh, how people used to live and how they dressed and how they walked and talked. Everything was very natural, except for the scientific accuracy was far, of course, <laughs> from the from truth. As if there was not enough drama already. Yeah, yeah I agree. So, um, if we don't have any further questions, I will be very happy to thank you all for your time, especially Professor Shimura and Dr. Park staying very late. It is, uh, oh, what is uh, about uh, 14, 15 plus 8, uh, 22. It's after 10 p.m. in uh, Korea and in Japan. And uh, Chunsheng woke up early to connect <laughs> to our webinar, to this session. I really appreciate your contribution to this session. We will be preparing a short uh, summary uh, and I will share with you to make sure that we reflected um, correctly all the uh, main messages from your presentations. Uh, the um, session was recorded and will be also made publicly available. I hope you, you all agree with that. If you do not agree, please send me an email about that and we will see how we can uh, remove your certain parts uh, from the video. With that, I'm happy to close the session. Thank you very much, everybody. I thank you to people who joined as an audience. We had some more than 20 people connected. And we also had people watching, hopefully, through the ERPA website. Um, I wish you uh, a very nice end of the week. Please stay safe. Follow the regulations, sanitary rules of your country. Try not to catch the virus. And uh, we'll talk to each other soon. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you. Bye. Bye. bye.